we come today for the second time to the words of our Lord Jesus in Matthew in chapter 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We looked last time at what these words mean. We saw that purity of heart does not mean sinlessness of life. Several folks have said in the last week they found that really helpful. Um, it, purity of heart does not mean sinlessness of life. That's good news because, of course, Christians in this world are sinners in the process of recovery until we are translated into the nearer presence of Jesus. Of course, there is growth. Of course, there is progress. But there is never perfection in this life. If we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What does purity of heart mean? We saw that it means two things. A pure heart, first of all, is an undivided heart. Uh, purity of heart is to will one thing. A pure heart is a single heart. It is the opposite of a divided heart. It is reflected in the Apostle Paul saying, it's not that I'm already perfect, but one thing I do, uh, forgetting what is behind, I press forward to lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has laid hold of me. So a pure heart is an undivided heart. And then we saw, secondly, that a pure heart is a clean heart. We saw that when Jesus Christ becomes yours and when you become His through this bond of holy union that is sealed with faith, uh, three wonderful gifts become yours. In fact, there are many more, but we looked at just three. Justification, which is a legal matter in which in Christ God drops all charges against you. That's the security of your salvation. Forgiveness, which is relational. Um, in Christ, God reconciles you to Himself so that you're not His enemy now. You are His friend in Jesus Christ. And then cleansing, which is personal. In Christ, God washes your heart and He washes your life. And we saw that this sixth beatitude is obviously about this matter of cleansing. Blessed are the pure in heart. We're talking about something being washed. And what will come of it? Uh, they will see God. So, we ended last time by seeing that this, command, uh, this beatitude very wonderfully um, relates to God taking the baggage of your life, the effects on your soul of stuff that you've seen and you wish you hadn't seen it now, stuff that you've done and you wish you hadn't done it now, stuff that you've loved and it's had an effect in your heart and it's had an effect in your soul. And Christ's taking that and He's washing you. He's, he's cleansing you. He is straightening out what has become twisted in the mind and in the heart. So, we saw that this is a very wonderful thing. We're looking at how Christ deals with the twisted patterns of your thinking, how He deals with the misdirected patterns of our loving, how He deals with the compulsive patterns sometimes of our behaving. And so, today we now come in the second part to the all-important question. We've seen what purity is. Blessed are the pure in heart. What a wonderful thing it is. And the question that's before us today is, how do I get more of it? How do I go after it? How do I pursue purity of heart? Well, it's hard to imagine anything that could be more important or relevant or more practical. I want simply today to offer two observations and then seven strategies. First of all, a couple of observations. The first is just to remind you that purity arises from the pursuit of the first four Beatitudes. Remember, we've seen that there is a roots life fruit pattern to the Beatitudes. The roots and the life we saw are in the first four Beatitudes. What are they? To be poor in spirit, to recognize your own need before God, to mourn your sins, meekness, which we saw is all about submissiveness to God, and a hunger and a thirst uh, for righteousness that comes out of the first three. These first four Beatitudes are the roots and the life of godliness. And then out of them come the next three, which we've described as the wonderful fruit um, what is it? It's mercy, blessed are the merciful, purity, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, and then we're going to go on, God willing, to see peace, blessed are the peacemakers. So, the first four Beatitudes are the means by which we pursue the last three, and we've consistently made the point in this series, you can't just start from the middle of the Beatitudes. You cannot simply start by saying, oh, well, now I want to go after purity. How can I get that? 
So someone asked me candidly, I really appreciated the honesty of the question after last week's message, what if you're not motivated to pursue purity? What if you know there's stuff in your life, but you love it too much and you just don't want to let it go? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? But you see, one answer to that is, well, go back to the second beatitude then, that's about mourning over your sin, seeing what it's costing you, seeing what it's costing others, see what it cost Christ. So, how do I get to the second beatitude? You get there from the first, which is to realize your own need and your own situation, and in fact, the, the problem of the heart that is not motivated in the presence of God. And another answer lies in the, in the fourth beatitude. Um, what do I do when I find myself in a position that uh, I'm loving something that I know shouldn't be there um, and I'm not ready to let it go? Well, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. How do I get there to the fourth beatitude from the third one, of course? What is that? To submit myself to God. Blessed are the meek. Now, my point here is a very simple one, and it's cumulative across this entire series that we've been running through the fall and through uh, this winter season. You cannot go after one virtue in isolation. The Christian life is a life, and each of these Beatitudes comes out of all that has gone before. The character of each pursues, uh, 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 comes out of the pursuit of those uh, that went uh, before. And that's why we've called this series Momentum, How to Make Progress in Your Christian Life. And we've seen that often when one falls off and you say, well, now why was I thinking that? You're, you're just cast back to the beginning and you begin to swing again and, and you move forward. That's what the Christian life looks like. Second observation is simply this. And it's a very important one. God calls us as Christians to be proactive in the pursuit of purity. Now, it's very important to get this clear uh, in your mind, and so let me just briefly draw your attention to the language of the Bible in relation to purity of heart. It is consistently uh, proactive in the call that God makes to us as believers. Let me give you some examples. James chapter 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, who's acting here? Who's the active agent? Purify your hearts, God says. He's calling you to do something. He's calling me to do something. He's calling us to be proactively engaged. There's something for you to do, active. Uh, for example, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, you find the same thing. Since we have these promises, beloved, so he's talking again to believers, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. Again, notice who is acting. We are. We are to do something. Let us cleanse ourselves. That's the language of Scripture when it comes to the pursuit of, of purity uh, of heart. Uh, and it's consistent. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Maybe you've not noticed this before and it's just slipped by you. It's very important for the pursuit of the Christian life. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. You see, think about this. The Bible never speaks about Christians justifying themselves. How, how could we possibly do that? The only time you ever have anything like that is the rich young ruler who tried to justify himself and, of course, found that he couldn't. You can never do that. But the Bible does speak about purifying ourselves consistently, again and again, cleansing yourself, it says. Something for you to do. So, something is different here. Something is distinct. It's very important. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. Here's the, the, the last of the ones I'll give you. I could give you many more. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself purifies himself as Jesus Christ is pure. Now, notice again, this is something in which the Christian is actively engaged. I wonder if that's something you would have been thinking. Is that in your mind? That the pursuit of purity is something in which God calls you to be actively engaged. So, this is of huge importance, and it's a vital distinction to get clear. The language of the Bible 
is always passive to us in regards to our justification, but it is consistently active for us in regards to our sanctification. When it comes to by being made right with God, and we looked at all that this means just last week, we can only look to Jesus Christ to do it. We have to say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. That's justification. But sanctification is different. Of course we look to Jesus Christ to make us holy, and I could quote you many scriptures in regards to that, but the pursuit of holiness is one in which from all of these scriptures and many more, the Christian is always called actively to be engaged. So just to quote Bishop Ryle here to uh, summarize this point, uh, he says this, in justification, our own works have no place at all. And simple faith in Jesus Christ is the only thing that is needed. In sanctification, that is the pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of purity, our own works, he says, are of vast importance. What you do makes a huge difference, a huge difference. And God gives us, notice the language, bids us to fight and to watch and to pray and to strive and to take pains and to labor. That's all biblical language about the pursuit of purity, the practical engagement of a Christian believer in, in regards to the pursuit of the Christian life. So, when it comes to being reconciled to God, I cast myself upon Christ, and Christ by His grace becomes mine and I become His. When I'm pursuing the Christian life, Christ has given me His Spirit, and because He has given me His Spirit, He calls me as a believer to be actively engaged in the pursuit of purity and of holiness. So, understand this. God puts a responsibility on you, on me, with regards to your growth, my growth, in the Christian life. Now, pause there for just a moment. I'm absolutely convinced that confusion on this single point is a major reason why so many Christians never really seem to make much progress. And it's tragic that that is true, but I'll tell you, I have been a pastor now over 30 years, as most of you know, and I have seen people wonderfully changed. And people who in large measure have got free from baggage and stuff in their past, and they have mastered the sharp tongue and the fearful spirit and the self-absorbed life, and it's wonderful. And I've seen over a period of many years that there are others who, despite professing faith in Jesus, really seem to make very little progress at all. And they remain pretty much as they were. And what happens over time is that they simply become an older version of what they were before. Nothing really seems to change much. So I ask, what makes the difference? What makes the difference between this person whose life has changed and there's a brightness and there's a, a victory and there's a triumph and there's a progress and this person who is simply an older version of what he or she was before. And I'm absolutely convinced, my friends, that the practice of the seven things I want to lay before you today is at the heart of the difference. And you know which you want to be, and I know which I want to be, and so, what is before us right now in these moments and the practice of it is of huge importance. There are things for you to do, and inasmuch as you do them, you will make progress, and inasmuch as you do not do them, you'll simply slide into being an older version of what you were before. So, seven practices, seven things you can do that promote purity of heart. Here we go. Number one, believe. This is something for you to do. 
And I'm thinking of James chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. The practice of trusting Jesus Christ to change you. Now, we really touched on this at the end of the message last week, and so I simply want to complete the point here today before moving on. Many people who profess to be Christians simply do not believe that Jesus Christ is able to deal with the baggage of their lives, period. They feel and they often say that the temptations are too strong, that their failures are too many, that their wounds are too deep, that their own lack of change has persisted for too long, and they actually feel that all of this is beyond even Jesus Christ Himself. And I'm saying to you that if you in your heart of hearts do not believe that Jesus Christ is able to change, cleanse you, then at that point you are not exercising faith in Him. I do not say, by the way, that you are not a Christian. Remember, Jesus said to His own disciples, where is your faith? He was not saying that they were not his disciples. They were his disciples, but they were not exercising faith, and that was why they were in such, a, uh, in such difficulties and why they were making such little progress. And it is possible to profess belief in Jesus Christ and yet not to ex uh, exercise faith in the power of Jesus Christ to actually change you. And, and James makes this point that when we come to ask of God, we have to ask in faith. And that if we do not come uh, as those who have faith in His ability to change us, then we're double-minded people, and a double-minded person will not receive anything from the Lord, is what James says. So that may be why there is so little progress, because you, in your heart of hearts, you do not really feel that Christ can change you. You do not have a vision of what He can cause you to become, and therefore there's no active pursuit of it that's going on in your life. So, I, I'm suggesting to you then first that here's something to do, because progress in the Christian life be begins with believing that Jesus Christ is able to cleanse you. So, to every person who's languishing in some kind of despair, and you feel that the habits of your mind are too ingrained, and the inclinations of your heart, they're just too deep, and the pool of your uh, desires, it's all just too strong, I want to say to you, look to Jesus Christ the Savior. He's cleansed other people. He's made extraordinary difference in the lives of other people. Why not you? Why don't you exercise some faith? You say you believe in Him. Why do you not have some faith in Him to change you and begin to ask of Him in that regard? So, here's the first thing. Believe, that is the practice, and it's something to do. You actually do this, of trusting Christ to change you. Number one is belief. Number two, confess. And this is not, you know, here are seven, pick one. This is here are seven, pursue all, okay? Um, number two, confess. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. I'm thinking here about the practice of naming and opposing particular sins in your life. And you know this verse well, I'm sure. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. So, here's the cleansing from all unrighteousness. Now, notice that the confessing and the cleansing are tied together in this very important verse of Scripture. When you set your mind to go after purity and you begin to exercise some faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe He can change me too. The next question really is, in what do you want Him to change you? What sins in particular do you need to set your mind and your heart against and ask His power to overcome? What are the big sins that lurk in your heart that need to be hunted down consistently whenever they rear their ugly head? Is it pride? Is it lust? Is it greed? Is it laziness? Is it all of the above? And what else besides? You remember in the fall, in the early part of the series, when we were talking about mourning your sins, uh, I said to you, here's an exercise for every married man in, in the church. Um, I want you to ask your wife for one sin that you should be fighting more proactively against. Do you remember that back in October? And I said to you, I'd already asked my, my wife that, because of course you've got to do that, practice what you preach. And, and I said, can you name one sin? You remember what she said? Can I give you two? She said. <laughs> well, you know. 
and I'm still working on them. She was very perceptive. And I've noticed points where I've said, even within the last month, oh, that's back to that old way of thinking again. You've got to fight that. You've got to fight that. If you cannot name or think of two or three specific sins that you're actively engaged in fighting right now, it probably means you're not making much progress in your Christian life. Whoever wins a battle without knowing what they're fighting against? This is the power of confession. So, build it into your life um, to bring specific sins as a regular part of your prayer, to identify them and say, this I confess, this I, I seek your cleansing in, and this, O oh Lord, I'm asking for your help to, to overcome. I want to make progress against this. I don't want to simply be an older version of myself in 10 years with this exactly as it is in my heart right now. I want to make progress and that's all confession. And, and of course, you'll know that our primary calling is to confess to God, but the Bible also speaks of the value and power of confessing to one another. Confess your sins to one another, the Bible says, and pray for one another that you may be healed, James chapter 5 and verse 16. And James is describing an environment of trust here where you have a relationship with someone who you trust and respect and someone who loves you, and you're really able to open up to them. What is the front line of the battle in your Christian life so that they can pray with you and they can help you and they can encourage you, and you really can make progress and not simply stay the same year after year after year? So, do this, especially um, if you are struggling to gain victory over a particular sin or temptation in your life. Number three, obey. Believe, confess. Number three is obey. Now, so many scriptures that we could quote here for the practice of immersing yourself in the Word of God. And I chose the word immersing deliberately for this reason, that the Scriptures have a purifying effect on the heart. And you find this in many places in the Bible. I wonder if you've noticed it in Ephesians 5.26, for example, when we're told that Christ loved the church and He gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her. So, here's this growth in purity and cleanse her. And how does that happen? By the washing of water with the Word, with the Word. So, what he's saying here is that the entrance of the Word of God into the mind and into the heart, where it is received by faith, applied, and acted upon on a regular basis, that that has a cleansing and a purifying effect in the life. It's a wonderful thing, which is why Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. Your Word, he says to the Father, is truth. Now, let me tell you candidly, as I've spoken about the experience of great encouragement in seeing folks wonderfully change and sometimes discouragement and disappointment in not seeing that happen. And I can promise you that without exception, where there has been real change in the stuff of a person's life, one factor in my observation has always been present and never absent. And that factor is that there has been an abundant entrance of the Word of God into the life and into the heart of a believer. And where there has been a failure to thrive, I have noticed without exception that one thing has been significantly absent. Whatever else has happened, oh, there's been fellowship, and there's been this, and there's been that, and all the rest of it. But one thing where there's failure to thrive that is always absent is a significant entrance of the Word of God into a person's life. People who are changing and are growing in purity are like sponges for God's truth. They're like sponges in the way that they listen to the preaching of the Word. 
as opposed to passively uh, letting it fly over. Um, they're sponges when it comes to the reading of the Word. They're asking questions about the Word. The entrance of God's Word gives light. It's, it's pure, the Word of the Lord. The psalm says that time and time and time again, and it is purifying in its effect in the soul. So, if you're really cracking a Bible open, you probably aren't making much progress in the pursuit of this purity of heart, this singleness of purpose, this life that Jesus Christ is calling you to. And if you would do this, it would make a difference. It really would. Proactively engage. Number four, and perhaps this is the most often missed of all of these um, strategies that I'm laying before you today. Number four is worship, the practice of gazing on the glory of God, the practice of gazing on the glory of God. And here I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Look at this verse and try and take it in. It's breathtaking. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed. So, here's the change we're looking for, the growth, the advancement in holiness and in purity. We're being transformed into the same image, that's the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another. Now, notice the two things in this verse. We are being transformed. That's what we want. How is it happening? Look at the other thing in the verse. It's happening as this person is beholding the glory of the Lord. And this verse ties these two things together, uh, because beholding the glory of the Lord becomes a means by which we are transformed into His likeness. And He's not, by the way, talking about heaven. You know, we'll behold the glory of the Lord there in the immediate presence of Jesus, but He's talking present tense. He's talking about something that happens in the Christian experience of a Christian believer now. So, this is of huge importance. He's talking about worship, and he's talking about the power of beholding something of the glory and the greatness of the Lord as I read the Bible, as I gather for a worship service like this, as I lay down my life in service for Jesus Christ, beholding His glory. And the principle here is that we become through what we behold. The more I see of Jesus the glory, the more I'm going to become like Him. The less I see of Jesus' glory, the less I see in the Word, the less I, I see in worship. Like someone who knows nothing about art, just walking by a Holbein as if it was of no value, and someone who knows its value says, how could you walk past that? The more I see of Christ's glory, the more I'm going to be changed on an ongoing basis, from one degree of glory to another, into His likeness. Now, let me try and break this down for you and make it really practical. Let's think of someone who says they are a sex addict. You think about this person, we'll have a conversation with them for a moment together, shall we? Compulsive habits, behaviors, built up as a pattern in this person's life over many, many years. And now this person who's in church has come to a place of feeling that there is no escape. You're going to try and help them. And you ask the question, how did you get here? How did you become what you say you are today? How did this thing come to gain such a power within your own life? And as you listen, you're able to discern what has happened, and you say something like this. You say, you know what? You have made an idol of this thing. You have set your affection on this idol. You went to the idol for comfort. You went to it for happiness. You worshipped 
your way into this addiction. That's what you did. You worshipped your way into this addiction. No. How are you going to get out of it? Answer? You worshipped your way in. You must now worship your way out. What does that mean? You cannot simply take down the idol. You are made to be a worshiper. Thomas Chalmers used that wonderful phrase, the expulsive power of a new affection. You become a worshiper of Jesus Christ in a whole new way, and you begin to practice gazing on the glory of God. Now, some of you know exactly what this change is like, because you can remember a time when for many, many years um, you just stood passive, as so many folks do, when others around you were worshiping. And you sat with your mind wandering while other people like sponges were soaking in the Word of God, but, but you weren't. You weren't receiving anything, really. But then you came to a place, and things changed, and now in the mercy of God, you have become a worshiper, and you are worshiping as you are changing, and you are changing as you are worshiping. It's beautiful. It happens to people. And if it hasn't happened yet for you, then this is what God is calling you today. You believe in that the Lord Jesus Christ is able to change you. It's got to start there. You've got to confess. You've got to start getting yourself immersed in the Word of God week on week. That's got to become a pattern in your life if you're really going to break this kind of a power. You're going to have to become a worshiper, not simply an attender, a worshiper in the Word and among the people of God, and all over the church, there are folks who have seen the power of lethal habits broken by the power of Jesus Christ. And this is the pattern. This is what it looks like. This is how it happens. Um, worship. Practice gazing on the glory of God. Now, G Jesus says, um, in the sixth beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And what 2 Corinthians in chapter 3 and verse 18 tells us is that the reflex is also true, that those who see God become pure in heart, that the more that you see of God, the more we behold Him with unveiled face, the more you're going to be transformed increasingly into His likeness. Remember how that happened for Isaiah? I mean, here's a man who you'd think, well, he, 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 he's in the ministry. He's a prophet. So he's full-time in, in, in work for the Lord. And, and, and yet there comes a moment in his life where he sees more of the glory of God as, than ever before. You can read about it in Isaiah in chapter 6. And what happens then? Suddenly he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. This man in the ministry is saying that. And he hadn't felt that before. He hadn't seen that before. But seeing the glory of the Lord now has a further purifying effect in his life. And this new glimpse of the glory of God um, moves him to begin to live in a whole different and new kind of a way. And he says, here am I, send me. And he's ready to serve as he wasn't before. And he had his agenda as to what he wanted to do, perhaps. And God gives them the toughest assignment of all. You can read about that in the uh, end of uh, Isaiah chapter 6. And it's his vision of the glory of God that sustains him in this extremely difficult task. Now you say, well, that's Isaiah. He actually got to see the glory of the Lord. But you see the point here in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Uh, the Apostle Paul saying that's what happens by the Holy Spirit through faith when you worship, if you're actively engaged in it. We behold the glory of the Lord, and that's why we get transformed. That's what it is. So, I think that worship may be the most underappreciated means of God's grace in all of the Christian church. Are you using this? When you come to worship, 
pray Moses' prayer. Oh, God, show me your glory. Help me in these hymns and in the preaching of the Word to see more of you than I've ever seen before. Help me to be like a sponge taking this in because, because that's going to be transforming in my life over time. Number five, ask. Ask. The practice of praying for purity. And you know this text, Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That is a believer's prayer a believer's prayer. And it is one that we ought to use often. Remember, we, we said that cleansing in its nature, like my car that needs uh, going through the wash again this weekend, just like it did last weekend, um, washing we need on a continual basis. So, you can't pray this prayer too often. It's not a one-time prayer. It's a believer's prayer. And we need to be asking it and using it on a regular basis. One quote from Thomas Watson today, most men pray more often for full purses than pure hearts. Is that true of you? Have you prayed about God supplying your financial need more often than your purity of heart, or your purity of heart more often than your concerns about your material circumstances? Most men pray more for full purses than for pure hearts. Let's set it together and individually to ask God and to go on asking God from a full heart that this heart will be purified. I want to make progress in this Christian life, O oh God. I want to stay where I am. Number six, persevere. Micah chapter 7 and verse 8, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament and this is simply the practice of getting up when you have fallen down, and it's very important. Rejoice not over me, O my enemies. When I fall, I shall rise, and when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Understand this as we renew our resolve to grow in the Christian life today. Nobody makes uninterrupted progress on the path of purity. Nobody. Nobody makes uninterrupted progress on the path of purity. So, when you set yourself to do battle against sins that may have held sway in your heart for a long time, you can expect that in some ways you will stumble and fall. And don't be surprised and don't be overwhelmed by another failure. Discouragement is uh, uh, blunts the cutting edge of, of many Christian believers. So, when you get tired of the battle, don't give up hope. When I fall, yet I will rise. And you say, oh, but you don't know how many times I've failed over this thing. I'm saying to you, never give up. Or you don't know how strong the pull of temptation is. I'm saying to you, never give up. You've put your faith in Jesus Christ. Never, 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 never give up. Never. Never. And here's the last, and it's simply this. Anticipate. 1 John chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3, these marvelous words. When we see Him, we will be like Him. And here I'm thinking of the practice of knowing who you are and rejoicing in what you will be. Who are you in Christ? You are dearly loved child of God. That's who you are. Very hard to sin willfully against a full knowledge of a love like that. So, take in who you are. It will really help you in pursuing purity. You are a dearly loved child of God in Jesus Christ. And what will you be? Well, what you will be has not yet been made known, but when Christ appears, we shall be like Him because we will see Him as He is. And notice the effect of this anticipation. John says, and everyone who thus hopes in Christ will purify himself even as Christ is pure. This has a purifying effect, the anticipation of what you're going to be. There's going to be no sin in you then. So, move towards that. 
You look at this temptation, you say, that is not who I am. I'm a dearly loved child of God. And look at what I one day will be. Now I cannot be looking back there. I have by the grace of God to press forward in the pursuit of purity. So seven practices that promote purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you know, it struck me, and this is the very last thing. Some folks have the idea that purity is something that you have when you're young and you lose it if you mess up. That's how it, the word is normally used, I think. In the Bible, purity is something that you begin to go after when you are in Jesus Christ. That will be wonderfully freeing for some folks here and I hope really helpful. So go after purity. Go after the clean heart. Go after the undivided heart. And the more you grow in purity of heart, the more you will see God, and the more you see Him in worship and in the Word, uh, the more you will see Him in the trials of your life and the triumphs of your life and in His people and in His church. And the more you see Him, the more your heart will be purified too. And all of this you see with the eye of faith until the day when Jesus Christ comes. And then you will see him face to face. You'll see the face of Jesus. And when you see him, you'll be like him. And everyone who has this hope, that is every true Christian, purifies himself, purifies herself, even as Christ is Lord, seal this into our hearts and into our minds and make us not only hearers of your word, but doers of it. And for all of us who may be given one more year in life or 10 more years in life, let us not be after that period of time an older version simply of what we are now, but let us grow in grace for the sake of Christ in whose name we pray. And God's people together said,